Hey, this is Gordy Johnson, the Big Sugar, and this is Toronto Rocks. Musicians in bars getting beer. It's Gordy Johnson. How you doing, sir? I'm fine. Uh, big fan, many years. Um, oh, well, thank you. Oh, nice. yeah, big Good fan. To talk to you. Big Sugar, you're doing a show coming up in, on December 28th. You want to talk about that? Uh, well, the show on December 28th is at uh, Danforth Music Hall in Toronto. It's our annual Danforth Music Hall play, which we've done for several years now. Uh, but this year is kind of special in that um, we're paying tribute to our to our bandmate and uh, loved one, Gary Lowe, who we lost this summer to cancer. Um, and we wanted to do a, a commemorative show just in his honor. And we are overwhelmed with responses from artists that wanted to take part to where we've got about 40-some guest musicians going to join us on stage playing Big Sugar songs in Gary's honor. We've got, uh, it runs the gamut. It's everybody from the Dream Warriors to the Road Hammers, you know, and, and, and all points in between. There's rock artists like, uh, you know, Danko Jones is going to be there. Um, Chris Murphy from Sloan and some some of the great reggae classic reggae artists that we've had the uh, the pleasure of working with over the years, people like uh, Willie Williams and Leroy Sibbles. So yeah, it's a, it's an amazingly diverse night of of people playing our music. It's a it's a huge honor to Sounds share the stage. Great. Sounds great. I saw you at Band Shell and it was uh, quite wonderful that night as well. Um, you've got some people in your band. Uh, you're you're a tight knit family, and uh, it goes back uh, up quite a long way. Do you want to talk about some of the members in your band currently? Well, yeah. I mean, everybody. It's not uh, it's not a gig you can audition for. Let's put it that way. It's uh, as different members have come in and out over the years. I've always just drawn from people that were part of our development and part of our musical scene. Um, not the least of which is my wife, who's been in the band for the last few years. You know, there, there was a point in our career where we actually thought about, you know, the personal tragedies are too much. We can't keep on doing this. Uh, and she really helped us weather the storm and got us all like, back on stage playing, change whatever we got to do to keep this happening and make it a positive thing. And so uh, she's kind of a miracle worker. <laughs> Yeah. and um, sat down with me and, and wrote an entire record. So that's it, it's got us recording as well. Um, Ray Artiaga is uh, our per- percussionist and, and one of the other vocalists in the group. And Ray is a great uh, curator of Cuban music and Tejano music and Mexican folk kind of music. And I've worked with him extensively in and around Austin. Uh, so we already had a great musical communication going on. So when I was thinking of well, what what direction should I go with Big Sugar, Ray was a Ray was an obvious call for me to make. Um, and you know, with Gary's passing, that, those are big shoes to fill for a bass player. Um, so I got Big Ben, who started the group Grady with me, and we recorded and toured for years. Um, yeah, we already had a musical communication going. So uh, he was a, a natural to move into that position. And same thing, you know, Big Ben was one of the few friends I have that could sit down with me and say, do you want to keep doing this? Because if you do, I'm there. And if you don't, I'm cool too. But, you know, so just keeping it in the family has been what's kept it going. Go way back. As a genre... Blues reggae is uh, kind of unique. I think when we first started to get noticed was playing uh, as a backup band for Molly Johnson, playing jazz standards and blues and things like that. And we played with lots of other blues artists like Lowell Fulson. And, and, um, you know, different artists would come to Toronto and promoters would hire us because we could play every style of music. We played with great Calypsonians, African musicians, blues artists from all over the U.S. Um so we already had kind of a reputation of covering everything genre-wise. Um, so even though we were playing jazz with Molly, we were we still had our hands in lots of different kind of music. I mean, you can even hear reggae stuff on our first two records, and that's before Gary was in the band. But that that was still a flavor that was part of where we developed our our sound in in downtown Toronto we were exposed to all these different kinds of music. And that was a very fertile time Mm -hmm. uh, for music and culture in Toronto, especially. 
Describe your early days in Windsor influencing musically. Well, in Windsor, it was different. Uh, um, it was just different cultures coming together. Of course, in Detroit, you had a great history of soul music, but also of punk rock and arena rock. I, I saw um, all the concerts I saw as a, as a teenager were in Detroit. Um, you know, Rush and Queen and all, all the great bands. So there was that. That was also a very fertile place and time. Radio. I mean, there were more great rock radio stations in Detroit at one time. And the, by the end of the '70s, it was kind of mind blowing. And you, you get spoiled having like four, five, six great radio stations to just flip to all day, every day. So yeah. that had a that had a big part of it. You mentioned Rush, um, another band that uses the double neck. Um, do you want to talk about some of your instruments? Where did, where did the idea for the Canadian flag on the back of your guitar come from? I'm trying to think of the first time we did that. Um, it might have been. I could be wrong. Someone will correct me, I'm sure. I think when we did a show with the Rolling Stones in 99, we played in Toronto with the Stones. They asked us to open for them. And that's a, you know, it was a big venue, big that's arena. And I thought, well, you know, we're going to be set up on a little postage stamp in front of their gear. Let's, we need to kind of bring it, you know. So we were wearing white suits and uh, it was all looking very epic. I had a white double neck or maybe it was the red double neck. And one of my crew guys actually took a beer, a box <laughs> and uh, cut out. It had it was obviously like Malta Canadian or something, and he cut out the maple leaf <laughs> so that you could see it was just the white cardboard, and you could see the red of the guitar through the, the hole where he cut mm. out the leaf. And they just used clear packing tape and just oh, <laughs> taped it to the back of the guitar. It up close, it looks so awful. <laughs> it, it's just the mo it's so gross. It's been rocked in for you know two decades. It's just disgusting. But it looked under the lights. It just looked amazing, and of course, I you know hiked it up over my head, and there was a Canadian Maple Leaf back there. So, and I, well, of course, I've been running that gag ever since. But it's highly effective. I have more than one double neck with a Maple Leaf on the back, so, uh -huh. just, so I have one wherever I am. I thought one of yours was uh, the same as Big Al's, um, and people were saying mm -hmm. that it was the same white double neck that Big Al did play, but. Uh, I'm it is, yeah. It, oh. uh, Al, I met Al when we were making Hemivision. It would have been like the end of 1995. Hot, yeah, I think about the end of the winter of 95. And I met him at a recording studio. And he'd seen me play with Molly Johnson and he liked my playing. And we just got to talking and they were recording, I want to say, Test for Echo. And um, he took me for a little look around the studio and showed me his guitars and I saw the white double neck and I'm like, oh my God, man, I saw you play that in 78. I saw you at Cobo Arena in Detroit on the Hemispheres tour. I saw that guitar. Wow. That, you still got it. That's crap. Wow. He was like, yeah, it's really heavy though. And it, I golf a lot now and it kind of messes up my shoulders. So I don't know. Do you want to, I'll just get my guy to pack it up. You want to take it? I don't know. Maybe it'll bring you luck. I mean, this doesn't happen every life, right? Like your heroes don't just invite you in the recording studio to look around and then give you the guitar that influenced you to become a rock roller to begin with. So know. I took the guitar and I hang, hung on to it for a couple of years and made Hemivision with it, all of it, uh, and a bunch of heated. But then, you know, I was like, I, wow, I was really nervous having it. <laughs> <laughs> Like, this should be in a museum or something, which it is now, actually, in a museum. Wow. But um, Al very graciously did uh, replace it with uh, one of the replica um, Xanadu guitars. He did eventually hmm. give me a, a replacement for it. But I have oh, several, nice. but that one's a really special one, as you can well imagine. Absolutely. Cool. That's a great story. So there's one of your influences, uh, but your influence, your range of influences, obviously with the reggae and uh, and the other styles of music that you've done. Um, do you want to talk about some of the other bands? I get a I get a Thanksgiving email and a 
Christmas card every year from Billy Gibbons at ZZ Top. That is one of the greatest accomplishments of my entire career. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> Honestly, I'm just, for, of all the people out there who's, who are great guitar players, and I have lots of great guitar player friends, I mean, I, I think I don't have any bad guitar player friends. They're all phenomenal, and I love them, and I love their playing. But that's one guy who, every time he plays a note, I just stand in awe. And he sure doesn't play very many. He doesn't play them very quickly. But there's just something about it, man. It's his whole delivery. And the older he gets, the cooler he gets. And I'm like, man, you just defy gravity, this guy. So um, he's one of my, still one of my big influences at all. Whenever I'm doing something, I'll listen back in the studio and go, what would the Rev do here? What would he, what would, if I was going to play this for somebody and ask their opinion, I wonder how that would go down, <laughs> you know, because he has on occasion phoned and said, now nah, I was listening to this Grady record and I wanted to, I had a few questions I wanted to ask you. <laughs> like, are you kidding? Is this a prank call? Who's this? Oh, yeah, that's awesome. really. And, so, uh, and what about the young people? Uh, you, you mentioned recording studios and such, and uh, are there some uh, people that you've worked with uh, on the production side that you want to give a shout out to? Uh, I mean, I've, I've continued a, um, a, a studio relationship with Warren Haynes, Government Meal, for many years. Um, whether I've produced the records or whether he's just sent things to me to mix, um, he's He's appeared on two of our records. Okay. Um, I've played on their records. It's it's a, a really great ongoing musical friendship that I'm, I'm very proud of. And I just did a uh, a live DVD five point one surround sound mix for him. I spent a couple months working on it, and uh, yeah, that just continues to be a great music relationship. Cool. Um, any local kids that? Uh that really stand out? Toronto, uh, well, I mean, local for me is Austin, Texas. So I'm, you know, I, I, music doesn't really have right. a national boundary for me. So, I, you know, I encounter musicians from all over the, the planet. But um, oh, we're always, you know, my, my mind's always open to, to hearing, uh, hearing new stuff. In fact, I'm going to a concert tonight that at least I've never heard of until my teenage son hit me to it, a cat from England by the name of Stephen Wilson. So I'm going to go prog out <laughs> tonight <laughs> to Stephen Wilson in San Antonio. <laughs> well, that's cool. Um, were there any uh, gigs that stood out in your mind uh, maybe early on in your career that were kind of life changers? Or- oh, I mean, man, we, you know, there were years when we did over 300 gigs in one year. I mean, I'm sure that that occurred for, for several years in a row because even before we had a record deal and we're on tour, I would do three shows in one day when I lived in Toronto just to pay the bills. I'd play matinee and then I'd play a regular bar gig and then I'd play an after hours party till five o'clock. I did that for years and I, I couldn't, I couldn't single one thing out. I mean, I was talking recently with, Tyler Stewart of the Bare Naked Ladies and back in the early days we used to jam quite a bit and we used to throw parties where we would just get a bunch of guys together and we would play I mean it's in the day before you use the term mashup but we used to do mashups of like Earth, Wind and Fire songs mixed with <laughs> TV, TV theme show music or an Ozzy Osbourne song or a, I mean you would just put the most most ridiculous things you could put together and make people dance to it was the was the the order of the day and we would throw these parties and just start playing and not stop playing for three four hours and we were just reminiscing about um, being at a some warehouse somewhere and like starting at three in the morning and playing till five six in the morning and um seeing people from all genres of music from like heavy metal guitar players getting up with us Ani DeFranco rapping just with, <laughs> with us providing the, the backdrop it was uh, it, it, thinking back to it it was kind of surreal
real. That's fair. That's cool. Do you have any uh, secrets on how you attain your tone for the gear guys, uh, such as uh, you're you're not using a razor blade on your cone to get that feedback, are you? <laughs> no, that doesn't work. Um, <laughs> no, uh, you know I I wish it was as easy as hey, get this gear and you too can sound like this because you just can't. Um, I mean, I've used such a, a vast variety of amps and, and equipment over the years from like vintage to Marshall, high watt, Ampegs, Fenders. I've, I've used um, solid state PA head with a power soak and a, I mean just all kinds of different things. I've used amp emulators. I've plugged into, I mean, at the moment I'm running a Roland jazz chorus amp which I see guitar gear guys look on stage and go no or no they because <laughs> didn't they didn't those amps sound really shitty in the 80s <laughs> well no it turns out they didn't they just there was shitty music coming out of them. <laughs> that was the problem but uh, the amps themselves sound fantastic so I think the fact is that whatever amp I plug into is going to sound like me. Yeah. And I think once people find their, their musical identity, you'd be amazed how easy that is. You just do what you need to do with your hands until it sounds like you. And you just become adept at making that happen with whatever the gear is. If you've flown overseas or gone to Australia or going to Europe and you kind of get what you get when you get there. And whether I was out playing steel guitar with Joe Satriani or I was playing heavy metal with Grady, managed to make the gear sound like those things I was doing. So don't have any, that the secret is, there isn't one. Oh, you definitely have a distinct sound. Where's the craziest place you've played the anthem? Oh, the craziest place I've played the anthem. Um, we played at Woodstock 99. And it was, we were playing in a, on a side stage in an airplane hangar. And it was about 100, 102 degrees Fahrenheit outside and 120 in the airplane hangar. And they were using it kind of like a de facto morgue, just people who were dehydrated, sick, overdosing, whatever. They just sort of threw them in this airplane hangar out of the sun. And we went to get up on stage and thought, oh, no. No, we drove all the way here for this. This is terrible. I don't want to be here. This is a horrible idea. And one, one minute into our performance, and I swear to you, about 5,000 insane people ran in the airplane hangar and were freaking out. And what? what? Oh, that was That was a real, like, I blink my eyes over and over again. How did this? Don't you remember this was a disaster a minute ago? That's cool. uh, and when we played O Canada, I guess there were Canadians there because man, when we played that, people went nuts. Good story. Um, so you were in the studio this week. Uh, I'm in the studio every week. <laughs> I I own a studio. I am a studio. I produce music for myself and others so I find myself in the studio yeah all the time I was working with the, the guitar player from the heavy metal band Down I was in the studio with me this week making a record I've been working on Big Sugar um, talking about Alex Lifeson earlier he sent me some tracks this week so yeah it's uh, every week is something different something coming out with Al or, or uh... oh yeah 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 I mean he's uh, I mean, we communicate back and forth quite a bit and uh, I used the guitar he gave me on a, on a song on the new Big Sugar record, so I sent him a, an early mix of it, and he sent back some guitar tracks, and we've been going back and forth like that for a bit, so I'm, uh, hopefully that'll be on the new record. I expect it will be, yeah. Oh, that's great. When's that coming out? Um, I'm hoping first quarter of next year. It's really just down to getting artwork and, and 
and such done now. Um, but yeah, rolling into as we are rolling into Christmas presently, it's it's hard to get stuff done. So early January, I'll just tie a bow on it, and that'll be it. Oh, that's great. I think your Spotify is new, isn't it? Oh, I have no idea. Somebody makes sure all of that stuff. I, I and I guess it's a full time job because you go online and it's like, oh, they've got all our records. Oh no, they don't. This one's missing. Why is this one missing? <laughs> Somebody's claimed the rights to it. What do you mean? But it's up in Canada, but it's not in the U.S. What? Oh. What do you mean they don't have heated in Australia? It's it's somebody's full time job to make sure that stuff runs. And I don't know how other artists do it, but man, it seems like it is nonstop making sure your stuff is out there. The internet, you can find anything, but can you actually though? That's right. So that's that's my opinion on that. I try not to get too involved in it. I hear you. You're a very rootsy guy. Very spiritual at a time. Tell us about the band's spiritual diversity. I mean, it's it's a group of individuals, so everyone has their own viewpoints and stuff. But I'm I'm still you know, I'm still deeply into it. I, I read read from the words of Haile Selassie, which I think is very pragmatic. In terms of religion, it's, I don't think of it so much as a religion as it is just a very pragmatic philosophy for getting along with everybody else on planet Earth. You know, it's like, it takes things, I like to think that it takes highly pol- charged political things into the boil it down to just common sense like you know treat treat everybody the same <laughs> you mm-hmm. know everyone deserves to be treated the same mm-hmm. it's not that complicated you know it's just kind of what i love about Rastafarianism. cool i very much appreciate your time today well it's been good talking this has been musicians in bars getting beer with gordy johnson from big sugar grady and much more i really appreciate it it's okay. been an honor Take care.